Oh my. That twist with the Fairy King. That is like some Ashita shit. Like, you find out this character that you assumed was a girl for so long is actually a boy, or this character you assumed was a boy for so long is a girl. That's the type of shit we just got in these, you know, two latest chapters. And I'm like, oh my god. <sighs> oh my god. So, we got two chapters. And quite the reveals, quite the surprises at that. And for one, these chapters kind of bring a lot of mystery as well so one thing i want to point out that many might overlook the like the the one thing that many will probably kind of just look past is that gil thunder is paired up with someone that's also called gil frost i think gil frost or whatever or something like that gil thunder is paired up with someone that has gil in the front of his name and that's that instantly sparks my interest in the character, because for one, many of us, when this character was first introduced, he looked like, you know, Zeratris. That's exactly what he looked like. He looked exactly like Zeratris, like a look-like clone. And after seeing the name reveal, it might be implied that maybe this dude is either A, a long-lost brother, or some form of relative to Gil Thunder, and if so, I'm looking forward to that, because it would explain the design of the character being very similar to Gil Thunder, or, you know, Gil Thunder's father, Zeratris, but that, that's one thing I wanted to point out, many might overlook. So let's get to the one of the main controversial topics of the chapters, or the two chapters, is we found out that the little girl that had, like, the tentacles and stuff wrapped around her, we found out that she is actually a he, and whoa! Whoa, and, and it doesn't just stop there. This she that is a he is actually the fairy king. And you're like, what? what? Like, this person is the fairy king. And we already know that the Ten Commandments can be comprised of non-demons. For instance, like, Balor. Balor is, you know, a giant. And now seeing the fairy king, like, that's the most shocking part, okay? What's the most shocking part is that the fairy king is working with the Demon Clan, and is a Ten Commandments, which, it's strange, because all the stories we heard throughout the constant conflict in the past, all the races kind of banded together to fight the Demon Clan, and seeing how the Fairy King was also fighting the Demon Clan in the past, what happened? And then, this raises many questions now with Balor, Balor's entire, I guess, reason to be there. I mean, Balor helping out the Demon Clan, because now seeing this, it makes you wonder, are these guys under mind control now, or is there something else going on here we're unaware of? Like, is there a bigger picture that we are yet to really realize? Because with this, with the Fairy King being corrupted like that, and working now with the Demon Clan, raises many eyebrows. I, I just don't know how to feel about that. I mean, it's a cool reveal. It's a very cool reveal, but this person... Instantly, you know that this this person's strong, very strong, because the Fairy King is strong. This is the original Fairy King that has the same exact weapon as King, and or a little bit stronger, actually, a lot more powerful, but still similar traits to it. And then on top of that, we have Balor. We already know who Balor is. I talked a lot about Balor, so factoring in Balor and then the original Fairy King into this fight. Oh shit, I, I can't even imagine how strong the Demon King must be. I can't even imagine. Because if the Ten Commandments are comprised of kings of different species, like, you know, for instance, the Fairy King, and then, you know, Balor, you know, he's like the original giant and stuff. I can't imagine how strong the Demon King is. Like, think about how strong he is when you factor in just these two alone from what we see. And I'm willing to bet these guys aren't the strongest. I mean, these two are definitely probably not the strongest of the Ten Commandments. There's many others we've really yet to see far into. So, you factoring all that in, that's scary. That That's really, really, really scary. So, talking about one other moment of the latest chapter, what happened to Escanor? Okay, so Nakama Sensei, you definitely proved a point there. I, I see what you did. Yeah, you proved a point. And that's exactly the point I was wondering if you would try to show. Escanor, in fact, can die. His weakness can be used against him. And I'm glad Nakama Sensei showed that. That is something I am very happy he did. 
because as I said when Escanor first revealed his power, he was a character that was amazing, but he's a character that could break the series. And it would not be a good thing, because he's the type of character that's so unbelievably powerful that he could just wipe out almost anything, and Nakama Sensei would probably eventually use him as some form of device to wipe out strong opponents, and I was fearful that, I'm very fearful that Nakama Sensei would, or could still do, but seeing how Nakama Sensei reminded us that... Escanor can be, in fact, killed. He was killed, actually. Let, let's take that into consideration. Escanor did, in fact, die in this chapter. He got impelled, and he was dead as fuck. And thanks to the Fairy King reviving him, it gives us two uh, answers, actually. It lets us know that Escanor can die. He can fucking die. And also, number two... The Fairy King, the original, can bring back the dead, and instantly we know that means that Elaine could possibly can be completely fixed, and maybe other things could possibly be fixed in the future. Now, that's the type of plot device I'm not a big fan of, especially when it comes to revival and stuff, so hopefully that doesn't get, you know, abused out the ass. But still, seeing that, 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 you know, raises many questions as well, where, you know, Nakama Sensei is going to take the story with that. But let's get back into the fact with Escanor, though. Escanor got wrecked. Like, he is in his weakened state, so it's to be expected. We already know, we already realize that Escanor is not strong at all. He's, like, the weakest among humans, pretty much, when it comes to him in, like, the middle of the night and stuff, or when it's not really sunny outside, or when he's in a cave. So seeing that, you know Escanor is not at his peak of strength. And so seeing him get wrecked, it's to be expected. I don't think any of us should really be upset with that. I'm not. I'm an Escanor fan, but I'm not upset with him getting wrecked, because actually, that's a good thing. It's good to see a character that looks like a fucking god or is a god getting bitch slapped sometimes because that lets us know he in fact does have weaknesses and i like characters that do have weaknesses i don't like the picture perfect characters that have no flaws at all so seeing escanor has some flaws that's very nice to see and it makes me enjoy his character so much more the main thing is is what type of role is escanor going to play into this fight because now that he is uh kind of useless at the moment I, I can't imagine, you know, how much of a burden he's going to be in the upcoming fights or how he can kind of fight when he can't really use his strength. So I have many questions on how Nakama Sensei is going to demonstrate, you know, Escanor being able to fight on his own without, you know, his godlike powers. So there'll definitely be some cool fights in the future for Escanor. Now, talking about other things as well, we also have it to where we get to see Elaine and Elizabeth. They're both teamed up as a pair and they're going to be working together in this death match or you know, matches against other opponents, and Bon and, you know, Meliodas are also working together, and different opponents, King and Diane are working together, you know, you have Gil Thunder and Gil Frost and stuff, I think that's the exact name, they're working together, so seeing this, we have our teammates, and it's definitely going to be a probably bloody battle, I can already see a very bloody battle happening in the future between these different, you know, characters, so yeah, the, these chapters, these two chapters of Ties, I... Mmm, I like him. And, you know, one thing I have to say about, you know, the mangaka of the series, he definitely gives in the quality when he does two chapters. I, I know some mangaka that do two chapters at once, but usually they kind of lack the quality of single chapters they release weekly. And seeing how Nakama Sensei can give two chapters back to back like he did, which is a lot of work. That's definitely a lot of work to do in one week's time. To be able to do something like that and then also continue all the, the massive reveals and quality in those two chapters is definitely good to see. And actually, these two chapters were better than even the single chapters. I'm not even joking. Like, the latest chapters I haven't actually talked about yet, they were good chapters. I'm not even going to say they're bad. There are really good chapters. There were some good reveals and stuff going down in them. But overall, they, they were nothing compared to these two chapters that released today. And that just it surprises me how Nakaba can actually do that. I mean, with, you know, a tight schedule of writing one chapter with... Week. I, can, I can't imagine how two chapters are in two weeks and you know, pumping out the quality content he did in those two chapters. So let me know your thoughts in the comments below. You all have a wonderful day or night wherever you live. Please be safe. Chibi out.